Hello and welcome to Business Strategy Live and today we're going to talk to Sarah and she's going to tell us about her business and, and the things that she's now doing to help businesses. Um, so Sarah, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, hi Stephen, thanks for inviting me on your show, quite excited to be here today. Um, during lockdown, we've, I think we've all had to sort of change the way that we work slightly um, and I decided that I don't know if people know that before I used to be involved with Indian food and, um, you know, cooking recipes, things like that. And um, obviously during lockdown, I haven't been able to get out to the cookery demonstrations um, or at the food festivals because there aren't any. Um, so what I did was I found myself giving away a lot of um, content that I have from YouTube videos or previous recipe articles and things like that. And um, what I found is that actually I was doing a lot more PR type stuff because we're using content that we already have and um, just giving it out. Um, I've had a lot of people come and ask me about how do I get myself out there so much? How come I've got so many things in newspapers or getting on TV, getting onto BBC News and that sort of thing? And I think what I can honestly say is in the last three years when I first started my business, I really, really struggled with it, you know, and I'd I'd had to use PR agents um, and stuff to try and get help or try and get recognised. But I found that, it, in all fairness, um, that even while I had somebody working with me doing PR, I've always had to do my own in the background. I never felt like it was enough. Um, <clears throat> and to get your reach and to sort of um, get yourself noticed, it was very, very hard Um in the place where I was coming from. Because in Indian food, it's kind of uh, more of a male dominated industry. And so what we have is we have um, a, a situation where you've, there's a, there's a mum who doesn't have a restaurant, who is cooking Indian food, but who wants to be seen and, and, and recognized without having a shop front. It's really, really tough. So, um, the best thing I could think about doing was trying to get recognized first through anything that was media based. Um, so there was a, a video that was done on YouTube, um, a friend of mine's a, a vlogger, and it was her that actually asked me to, to do this video. And I showed her how to cook a curry. She put it on her YouTube channel. And the next thing I knew, it kind of went viral. We had loads of views on it. And about a week later, she contacted me and said, well, you know what? Your video is getting more views than my usual stuff. Um, so it's something that you need to think about. So I took this video and I sent it to Channel 4 in a moment of cockiness, I suppose. And I sort of just told them that, um, you know, I'm a mum and, you know, I uh, this is what I do. I cook. I teach people how to cook Indian food as simply as possible. Um, and they weren't interested. <laughs> they were just like, and? So... About a week later, I actually had a call from them and they said, we've got a new um, program that's coming up and we think you'll be a good fit. Uh, so this is after they've already said no to me. Um, and then what happened was I was included in this um, TV series, which was a uh, like a reality cooking show where I was cooking with Prue Leith, uh, Michael Keynes and Raymond Blanc. They're three really big celebrity chefs. I don't know how that happened. But it, this happened, maybe it was the right time or whatever. Um, so we did three months of filming and I got to see this sort of insight of things cooking on TV and that kind of thing. Um, but what uh, one of the things I guess I really came away with is I really enjoy it. I really love the media stuff. And um, I know that when I first started, it was quite I was quite scared, quite shy, quite nervous. Um, and I think I was probably some sort of imposter syndrome feeling that I experienced. I think most people experience in business anyway. And I suppose um, from that, I, I used that opportunity to leverage myself as much as possible. I felt like as soon as the filming had finished, I was really bored and I wanted something that was kind of just going to keep that momentum going and talk about it. So I am. Um, I, I thought, well, how can I do that? And how can I get seen as much as often without having a shop front? So I thought, well, you know, it's it's the news that's being read all the time, media, newspapers, magazines, um, which, you know, especially like online things that are available now, things like blogging and, you know, I, I guess social media is really 
been able to help us all in us reaching our business goals. So what I did was I um, approached a local newspaper and I said, look, um, you know, this is my situation. I'm a mum. I have four children and I, I think I have a lot to offer in terms of telling people how to cook Indian food. Would you give me a food column? And they said, no, why would we do that? We don't know if you can cook. And I said, yeah, we don't know if half of the people who've got food columns can cook, really. And there was a, you know, a little bit of a debate on that. And I said, look, why don't you do this right? Why don't you let me come and cook for your husband, you and your husband at home? And if you like the food, you give me a food column. And if you don't like the food, um, you know, we can we can just forget about it. Um, and funnily enough, they agreed to that. I went to the house, I cooked for them. They loved the food and I got a food column. And then I used that food column to get myself in another 12 food columns which were national and international. So I was uh, writing articles for Spain, for India, for Guyana, for Bangladesh, for um, for Singapore, Malaysia, and the rest were in England, which were like in places like Birmingham, um, sort of up north, as many as far well as I could stretch myself. Because the thing is, once you've got one, you can just copy and paste. It's so easy. Um, and it was it was just, much easier than I thought it would be to achieve. So the PR thing kind of went really good for me and I felt like I was able to to achieve things. That I think when you've got guts and you're able to not feel too scared about approaching and not being scared to have someone say no to you, I think that's one of the keys, is to not worry like if someone says no just because one person has said no. It's a bit like being at a call centre where you, know, you call a million people, there'll be one person who is interested in listening. Um, but I don't think I had a real hard time with it. I think there were so many people who were willing to listen, who were prepared to help me, um, because most of these people, they're looking for content as well. So what I've started to do since lockdown is really use this time to enhance what I guess my profile was to try and make it get a bigger reach. But I've also been helping people who have difficulty with reaching their PR goals. Um, if you just go and join a PR company, normally you are really, really spending a lot of money, which a lot of people don't have right now. Um, and also you're sort of told at the beginning that you have about three months before you can expect any sort of coverage, um, which is really, if you think about it, and if you're paying, say, a thousand pound a month, you're looking at three thousand pound before you get any kind of coverage. And even then you don't know what kind of coverage you're gonna get. So what I really like to do is just it's just really to prove that actually you don't need to wait three months. And there are so many ways of getting yourself featured in magazines and newspapers. And I love doing that. Um, I think it's probably because I have such a passion for it that it goes quite well. So I thought, seeing as we're doing this today and for all the people who are listening, one of the uh, a few key things that is probably really important for those people who do want to do their own PR or who want a bit more help is first of all you can you know you can follow my, my um you can follow me and get tips uh free completely free for everybody who wants to do it for themselves um but anybody who wants individual coaching or if they want uh you know sort of one to one or if they would like me to help them completely take over the PR which is like a fraction of the cost in comparison to a big PR company and the reason for that is because I do work from home, I work in my own time, and I don't have a whole load of people that I'm working for or huge overhead. So that's the reason why I can afford to, to help people um, achieve those goals. So I would say I'm gonna just give you some tips on how you can help yourself get out there a bit more. And number one would be your bio. Um, the first and most important thing is to have a bio at the ready all the time and to, keep updating it. So my bio is actually on LinkedIn. And I use that bio because I want people that I'm connecting with to know the latest things that I'm doing. Um, I loved LinkedIn. So what, I suppose before I say uh, the bio on LinkedIn, I should probably be saying LinkedIn, uh, have an account on LinkedIn, because I think that's where you can find people that you need to connect with, or um, it's such an, an, an incredible way to get hold of people that we probably wouldn't be able to find um, if it wasn't for LinkedIn. 
I think that's true. LinkedIn is great to find contacts and make contact with them. I've found that when you post stuff, I, I, I don't find that I get very many people respond to it. Do you do you get responses to things? Like that? Well, um, in terms of likes and comments, um, I, I think the best way to get interaction through LinkedIn is to actually tag people. And I don't mean like tag 50 people or 100 people, because I think what that looks like when you get a notification is sometimes it's not even relevant to you. And people tag you in and if anything that just annoys me but if it's something um that we're talking about um like say we're talking about this today and if there was somebody who was getting involved or sending us a comment and we wanted to reply to that comment if we were to go onto linkedin and then talk about this having this um discussion and about the comment then we would want to tag that person in because that comment is relevant to them so i always think it's quite important that don't just spam everybody um, because like no not everybody's dying to to hear the news so I always think just tag the people who it's really relevant to yeah I get really good reaches on my LinkedIn um I looked at a post that I did a while back and I've had like over over 1200 views on it which is um I wouldn't say that was one of the posts that was it was okay it was an okay post but it was talking about Rotary Club so um when we're talking about Rotary, that people think that people aren't really interested in Rotary, but when we've had people who've actually gone in and read the post or have watched or, you know, actually read whatever you have to say, that means, well, there are people that are interested. So it kind of answers a question in, in one way. Um, another way that I think that it's really important for us to, to get out there and to understand LinkedIn is to actually write articles about what you're doing because the articles get... Um, they're kind of picked up by Google and they're, they're also, they're highlighted, you get more views on it and it gives you more sort of, it validates your expertise in your area as well. So I always think that doing art, doing posts on LinkedIn is important, but I always think that creating an opportunity for an article is definitely a way forward um, and helps you get recognized as well. So, one of the first articles I ever did, or maybe not one of the first, one of the first food articles I ever did um, was about the health benefits of okra um, in, a, in an article on LinkedIn. And actually it was that that gave, it was such a, you know, such, such a huge amount of people who commented so many views on it. I just was not expecting it. And it was, Kind of because of that, I kind of took that article and thought I'm going to actually send that to a few um, places who talk about food. Um, I sent it to someone who, uh, one of the magazines that talk about gluten free, uh, someone that talks about things like vegan um, and that sort of thing. Because if it if it fits that category, you can send it in lots of different places. So um, I always think if you want to get yourself known one of the, the the good things that you need to do is have a bio that's, that's definitely up and ready for everybody to find out who you are and what you're doing and keep that on LinkedIn as well but update that bio all the time the next thing I would say is have a backup of images of yourself now this might sound a bit like really um but yeah you need a set of images that you're really comfortable with that you you that make you feel confident that make you feel like it gives the message out or that speaks your language of what you're trying to talk about. Um, if you want to be seen as someone who's kind of really fun and you want to give that sort of fun outlook on your the stuff you're doing, then I would really strongly recommend getting someone who is, you know, another small business owner um, and, and see if you can help them and they can help you if there's collaboration available um, and get a back, like a whole, like a little, little bank of images. Um, and use those images in your articles, when you're talking about what you're doing. Um, if you send anything to any newspaper, always send an image of yourself, whether they use it or not, because um, the chances are they probably will use it. And you want to be known um, in that article next to whatever you're writing about. You want your face there. You want people to know who you are and so that you can be seen. The other thing I'm going to say that I would say that the third tip is to um, get involved as a speaker. Uh, I'm not talking about getting paid to speak. That is something that we all want to do and we 
I guess some of us to some extent we do already do that um, but I think that speaking and giving whatever value you can to people through other platforms which are open for business which are helping other people reach their business goals and um, being here today speaking about what I'm doing it gives me a platform um, and it's able to spread the word about the things I'm doing but Getting involved as a speaker is so good for, for both of the parties that are doing this. It's that joint collaboration, spreading the word, and I'm um, sorry, Steve, I've got hay fever, so I'm trying not to sneeze. <laughs> That's right. That's um, right. Yeah, so getting involved as a speaker is definitely uh, something that I, I really strongly recommend. And, you know, I know a lot of people have said to me in the past, but, you know, do you speak at all these things? You always get paid. No, I don't always get paid. What I do get back from it is actually the ability to um, be able to talk about what I'm doing, uh, the the ability to be able to um, spread the word on what I'm doing, but also to get to find out what other people are doing. Because once you get involved in these, um, like this business strategy, I'll f I'm talking about myself. So obviously, next time when you've got someone on, I'm going to be looking out at you know who have you got on next and what are they going to be speaking about and what are they going to be helping with. So we ultimately find a lot of help um, through these platforms, um, places that we can turn to for advice, free knowledge and free advice. So not everything has to be paid. You get a payback in another way. And um, and so I always think if you can get involved as a speaker, if somebody says, look, you know, we need a speaker, would you be able to do it? Um, sometimes there is a budget and they can't pay you, um, you know, uh, and if there isn't, there isn't. I'll tell you what I did actually do cookery demonstrations all over the country at food festivals one year completely free i never um, actually took money for it once in a whole year in my first year of starting i just decided to use it as a strategy to get myself more known and it was probably the best strategy that i could have come up with because in that year although i didn't get paid and i know that other people were coming along and getting paid um, one of the, the things I do is I take note of how things like this operate because this is my field and I need to know how it works. And when I would go around to a food festival, most of the time they'd say, like, could you do a food, could you do a cookery demonstration? And we don't have any budget to pay you. Or they would say, we have a small budget. Um, but I know that there were people who were coming from MasterChef or places like that who would be getting paid quite a lump sum of money. To be um, to be there, but what I decided was actually a small sum of money doesn't do much for me. Um, but I find that doing things like the food festivals <coughs> offer me other benefits. So, for example, it's a day out with my children. So whenever I go and do a, a cookery demo, the first thing that people say is we don't have a big budget. I say, but is it okay if I bring my children and they'll have a look around the festival? And they're like, yes, of course. How many kids do you have? Oh, I have four. They're like, oh my god. You know, so they let four kids in. Um, and so I get um, my children to come and watch me and at the same time they also film me so I'm getting my videography done by my children my, my oldest daughter's 18 um, and and I also get them to interact with me as well so we found at some of the food festivals we'd have my f my children's friends would be there and so they would come up and join in with the cookery demonstration as well things like that so it's that sort of interaction with the crowd um, but I guess one of the other things that really worked for me is the fact that I didn't ask for any money meant that I think that they almost felt like I had done them a big favor. So what they did was every time they promoted the event, they used my picture and spoke about what I was doing at the event, even though they paid somebody else a lot of money to be there. They would sort of say, well, you know, um, this person is going to be here and that would kind of get the crowds or they would, you know, that's how they would see it when they write up a press release but then they would do a big thing about what I had done and 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 how much they loved it and the comments that came from the people feedback and all of that is really precious to me especially in my first year of business so I used all of those cuttings you know from the newspaper I cut them out and I kept them in a folder and I've got like two folders full with people that have literally used their PR to just help me out because they didn't pay me um, the other thing I found is that because they didn't pay me, they also asked me to go back the following year and again and again and again. So we found, that, you know, in actual fact, sometimes that payment won't get you that far. 
um, I, I prefer payment in, in kind like that because it makes my reach a lot stronger and makes it, you know, makes me go a lot further in what I'm doing. Increases your profile massively. And that's, that's really important. And also, as you say, people do often appreciate the fact that you've helped them out and done that sort of stuff. So I can see that definitely being a very good strategy to follow. Definitely. Yeah, but I think that also we've had like people who actually run in the food festivals, they have become like, you know, very close friends with me. Like they were literally now if they're doing an article on something that requires somebody from a foodie background, these are the people, the ones who I felt like I had, I, well, I feel like, you know, they were helping me anyway to get me involved in the food festival, even if the, there wasn't a payment involved, just to get me to be able to have that opportunity to speak to people. But then they will firsthand, they would give me a call and say, Sarah, there's a, you know, an article that's happening. Do you want, do you want me to pass you the information? Or do you want me to give them your details? Or you know, so I, I always feel like it, it, it builds a relationship much better. PR is all about public relations and it's all about building those relationships with people. Um, so I guess you know that's part of how I've been able to achieve really good PR in the in in the last few years. So that is my fourth tip was to really get involved as a speaker wherever you can. And um I guess my final, my fifth tip is to make sure that you have the ability to believe in yourself and be confident. When you write a press release to somebody, um, don't be shy about giving out the knowledge that you have. Don't think that it sounds really like, oh, I'm really bigging myself up and you know, I really sound like I'm full of myself. If it doesn't sound right, an editor will go through it and make it sound right. So all you need to do is put what you need to put in there so that you can just give everything that you can to whatever press release goes out. Um, writing a press release is, as well, I guess, a, another thing I probably should have pointed out on here. A press release, if you haven't done one before, it consists of five Ws. Who it's about, what it's about, when it happened, where it happened, and why it happened. So these five W's, who, what, when, where, why, if you just write that down in your diary or whatever, if you've got a bit of paper with you, just write it down and you can actually create a story on anything with these five W's. So you don't have to wait for something to happen. If there isn't anything exciting happening right now in your life or you know in your business or anything, you can just actually create something. Just use those five W's to give you guidance on what, do I think is actually newsworthy? And how can I create this into a story? Make a story out of it that would be interesting for people to read. And especially if it's giving something back. So if people read your article and it's actually really useful for people to read this to help them, then <laughs> chances are nine out of 10 times you'll be printed anyway. Because it, if, if it's giving back to community, these newspapers and media, they are a lot to do with giving back. So. I know that they can sometimes have a really bad um, sort of uh, picture painted about them. But on the other hand, I think media has been incredibly amazing for me and for me to sort of get myself out there, help me to start a business, help me in so many ways. Um, there are so many platforms as well right now that are um, that are available for people to get themselves out there on for entrepreneurs, for small business owners. Um, there are hundreds. This sort of live business strategy is is one of them. So if you're included in this, you need to, the way for you to get more views on some of the things you're doing is by actually helping other people. So when I finish from this meeting today, one of the things I'm going to be doing is talking about what I was speaking about on here and then doing a post about the live business strategy and posting it for Steve because that's how we all help each other um, in the small business world. Thank you. That would be great. I think also, Martin, just um, because I've put it on the list, I've probably gone on a point six here, is to apply for awards. Whether you think you're award worthy or not, just apply for awards anyway. Get used to writing award applications um, and use the bio that you've already got ready to help you to fill in that bio. Um, because you can take the more that you have written in your bio on your LinkedIn profile, or anywhere else, the, the more you use that, the more um, regularly you update it, the more familiar it becomes to you. So whenever somebody's asking you a question, 
you can refer back to that bio and think, what do I have in that bio that is asking me this question? And if you don't have something in there, you know it's time to update that bio and put that in there because that's what questions people are looking for. And so it helps both ways. But applying for awards is a really good way to get yourself out there um, in, in the media because whether you win or you don't win, the fact that you get actually noticed by these people once an application goes in, they have to look through you to find out who you are. They do their own research on you and they sort of decide whether it's right for the category um, that you've applied for. And if you've never applied for uh, for an award before, there's a possibility that you might not actually get anywhere in this. You might just have had your application seen, but it didn't get anywhere. But that's your first step to starting to apply for awards. What you can expect after that is the more regularly you do them, the more you're going to get seen. And the more you're seen is the more likely you're going to win an award. Because awards actually come from how prominent are you in the position of being in the local business community. So the more you put yourself out there, the more likely you are to win an award. Um, and although this is about PR, awards is a lot to do with PR. Um, you know, once you get in and you get, even if you're just like a, a, a semi-finalist, you get a little badge that you can put on your website, like a downloadable um, badge that you can put on there. You also get listed in, in some sort of press release that will go to the news. Uh, so you're, you're getting seen without trying very hard at all. It's just by filling in an application. So I can't stress enough how important awards are for your business. I've won seven awards and 39 accolades in the last two years. And I know, <laughs> you know, honestly, it's just, and that is the honest strategy that I had for it was I never saw myself as someone who would, would in a way, it was never in my, you know, in the, in the front of my mind to ever go and put myself forward for something like this. But I decided to do, do that just almost three years ago. I thought, let me just give this a go. Um, I really had no idea what I was doing. I put myself up for business mother of the year and I had an email back from them saying, no, you're not the best mom of the year kind of thing. <laughs> and no, you didn't get through. And I thought, oh, I thought I was a really great business mom, but clearly not. But what happened from that was uh, somebody else had nominated me for another award, which was influential woman and inspirational woman. So although I lost that, I was actually recognized by somebody else um, for these other two awards, which were two of the kind of big awards that were going there. And to be a finalist in both of those, and actually I won one of them and then went on to win the national for influential women. But um, the just being in that sort of the first steps, the first step that ever happened with applying for the award was I knew I didn't know what I was doing. So once you know that you actually don't know what you're doing, but you're going to try it anyway and you're going to put yourself out there, it's, uh, overcoming the first step and once you've done the first step the, the, the rest becomes really really easy I, I can't tell you how easy it was to achieve the things that I have and people can say well maybe it was luck or maybe it was time and I'll tell you what it is it's actually just putting yourself out there and not caring about whether you get through or not it's putting it out there and just saying well if it does happen that's brilliant and if it doesn't happen it's okay uh, and just knowing that it's okay because you know we my first and foremost priority is that I'm a mum so as long as I'm still being a mum and I'm still putting dinner on the table, then everything else is good. So um, the rest is a bonus. So I would, these, I guess, are the six tips that I would say, your bio, make sure your bio is always updated, make sure that you've always, you've got it on LinkedIn. Um, a bank of images that you should keep. If you don't have a bank of images, like find your favorite images and, and use them. But always, whenever you send anything to a journalist, make sure that they are high res images and also make sure that you've checked your spelling and grammar. I know that sounds really silly, but there is an editor. So don't worry too much if you're, if that's not your strong point, but things to just be aware of. Get involved as a speaker, um, which will just really help you to feel confident about what you're doing and applying for awards. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, how are you getting on with some of the other things you're doing as well? Cause I know you're, are you, President of Rotary Club, which one's that? Yeah, I've just recently been made um, president of my Rotary Club, which is Pool Bay Rotary Club. And um, it's quite, I had my first ever meeting uh, yesterday that, that I hosted as president. And it is really an honor because um, when I first joined Rotary Club, I was told that it I, I wouldn't be suited to something like Rotary Club. 
and I was firstly too young. I'm an Asian woman, and I wouldn't I wouldn't fit in there, which I can honestly say is just. <laughs> um, they are just amazing at doing charity work, and I'm so proud to be a part of what what they're doing at Rotary. But I also I'm very proud that my club in particular are very diverse and you know they are just it doesn't the way that I'm made to feel at the you know at being president of the Rotary Club is um, it's real it's a real honor um, and it's great to be a part of it so yeah I'm enjoying um, this it, lockdown has actually helped me specifically to to focus on these areas of, of building the PR business and to do this as a president for Rotary I've had to step back in other areas um, I would have had to have stepped back either way, but I'm really glad that now I kind of know exactly where I'm heading. I know what I'm looking forward to in the future, and I've got my goals. Actually, one of the other things I should have said to you is is about a vision board. Probably one of the most important things that you can do is to have a vision board. I don't know if you've got one, Steve, but I've been working on mine yesterday. And um, once you start writing down and your your plans for the year or for, for your year ahead or, or for the future. I think that once you start looking at it, and once you, you, I've been watching a lot of videos on this, and I think I really am in the belief that if you do follow this through, I mean, I don't know what you're gonna gain from doing it anyway. Even if you didn't believe in it, if you just did it anyway, I'm not sure what you'd lose from it. It's quite quite a good bit of, of fun. I sat down with my children yesterday and I used it as um, a part of my homeschooling uh, that I do with today we're making a vision board so I want you to tell me exactly what you want to do and halfway through I, I noticed my son were putting pictures down of things that would involve me spending a lot of money and I almost wanted to say to him no 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 take that off take that off but then I thought this is his vision so it's not really about me uh, saying what I want so I let him just um, just let him do it but I put my my vision board up and a lot of the stuff that I'm doing right now with PR one of the things on there is is also writing a book. So um, yeah, I, I think that these are things that would just kind of help us getting our business goals and reaching them. Writing a book that sounds like quite a major undertaking. I, and lots of I, I do know other people who've written books and stuff like that. But and they tell oh this is great. You should write a book as well, sort of thing. But I just think that it seems like quite a lot of work to write the book and and, and yeah. what you get out of it. What are your sort of thoughts on the book? I have written a book um, before on how to apply for awards. And actually, I wouldn't, I don't feel like I wrote a book because what I did was um, at your um, charity forum meeting, if you'll remember the award presentation I did, I basically changed the presentation into a book um, and just put that on Amazon. And I didn't feel like I had written a book because I felt like that was more of a presentation, it was quite different. Um, but I am going to be writing a book and I've, uh, the work and the research that I've done on it is actually, you know, you think oh, this is going to be really hard. Where do I start kind of thing? But if you have an overall plan of writing a book, I think the best thing that you can do is is do it as you were doing it in small chapters. Um, so you break it down into smaller parts. And if you break it down into smaller parts, you don't have to have one book. You can have like every chapter could be one part of the book so part one part two part three um and that's the way that i'm going to do it because just like you steve actually i'm quite horrified at starting a, a, a kind of big life but it is going to be about um the past 20 years of my life so i am going to be breaking it down per year and it's going to be uh one year per per um per book so 20 books is the plan wow <laughs> that's, that sounds good <laughs> at least there should be uh covering 20 years there should be plenty of things to put in there in content wise and at least you know the content very well so yeah, so I, yeah i think when it comes to content what i'm really looking at is it's it's almost talking about um the the first get step i suppose is how i came from sort of where i came from and then sort of doing the stuff that i'm doing um managing children as well but it's also about uh, the life as a sort of being brought up in England being born in England but raised with Asian parents and the cultural side of things and being held back to some extent of you know of, of things in in life and certain decisions that we make in our life things like that and I think um, if anything I think it would be a really good I don't think there is a book yet that there's a role model um, that I can think of for more Asian women 
And so I was thinking it would be quite good to sort of target that audience for those other girls who are born, you know, uh, same as myself with Asian parents and that kind of thing. So I think it would be really interesting to see that and it would be nice to be seen as a role model in that area. So I'm really looking at, at sort of talking about my own experiences, but really helping people to overcome theirs. Yeah, no, that sounds good. And I, I, you're an inspiration to everyone, I think, <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, so yeah. that's definitely one of the things that, um, that I'm going to work towards. But I keep saying I'm going to do it, um, but I've written it on my vision board, so now I have to do it. Okay, that's good. That's good. And you do so what, what is it you do with the FSB? I know that uh, Chris oh, Davis so is getting a plug in for that. <laughs> I'm the leader of the food policy for FSB. So okay. um, whenever we we have anything that we want to change with lobbying or things like that, we ask around loads of food businesses, we get in touch with loads of people in the food industry, and then um, we bring together a plan and we take that to um, to sort of try and change the law on things. Wow. That's, uh, that's a pretty big job too. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be an ambassador for FSB. Um, I found over the years there are there are a few things that I'm working with at the moment. FSB is one of them. I'm also um, part of I Entrepreneur, which is the letter I, which means I am entrepreneur, which is for both communities. So anyone who is you know black and ethnic minorities and um, and what they do is they highlight and they raise the profile of um, of small business owners who are within those communities. Uh, so um, that's only quite a new thing. So I'm I'm very proud of being a part of that. <coughs> We've also got um, F Entrepreneur, which is for women in business, female entrepreneurs, and that kind of thing. Um, so I I have been a, listed in their first ever series of that in um, what was it? not last year in 2019 yeah they started in 2019 and they've had the the second one this year but for the second one this year they get a whole new 100 people who are part of the female entrepreneur so they select women from all over the country who are outstanding at doing business and they basically highlight them and they they just help them go a bit further as well so it's great to be a part of that this year i was you know, chosen to be the speaker at the House of Lords for the new for the new batch of um, entrepreneur women. So I've got under my belt those um, hundred women that you kind of connect with when you go through these female entrepreneur sessions and stuff. But then I've got the other hundred from this year. So I've got these two hundred female entrepreneurs that we work really closely together with, wow. um, and that is empowering in itself. So, Speaking of the House of Lords, that's an incredible opportunity. That's, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, there are so many um, brilliant things that are going on around us. And, you know, we've got the local um, things that are happening, uh, people who are really spreading the word and, and broadening opportunities for people. I always think that, you know, we're, we're living in the South Coast, we're in Bournemouth, and we, I, I just sometimes think that there aren't as many things going on here as in London, obviously. But I always think that there are so many opportunities where we could be making things like this. So it's always good to connect with people. It's great to be doing these kind of things um, and to get in us, you know, getting ourselves out there. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's really good. Uh, uh, yeah. I think we're, we're nearly done on our time. So um, thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. And, and, and uh, you are a fantastic inspiration in every field so so well done for everything you've done and i really appreciate you participating as my guest today that's been fantastic sarah thank you very much thank you. once you've um, sent the video to me i will be posting it out so yeah if anybody else is watching here please do connect please do like and share the video as well okay thank you thank you bye